Hey everyone, welcome to Operations, the show where we look under the hood of companies in hypergrowth. My name is Sean Lane. One of the perks of having your own podcast is you have a great excuse to ask people you've long admired to sit down and talk to you, you know, for work. 10 years ago, I joined this barely formed fellowship program called Venture for America. It's a nonprofit that takes recent grads and trains them as entrepreneurs to work at startups in lower cost cities like Detroit, New Orleans, Cleveland, Providence. If you know anyone that did Teach for America, it's that, but for startups. What was a pleasant surprise to all of us involved in those early years of Venture for America wasn't just the fellowship itself, but the community that sprang up from the fellowship. The chief operating officer of the startup that was VFA, and our guest today, is Eileen Lee. Following six years running VFA, Eileen moved to Atlanta and is once again putting her community building chops to work as the co-founder of The Lola, a physical workspace and digital community designed for women. In our conversation, Eileen teaches me about what it means to be a community builder, how she was initially wrong about The Lola's target audience, and why the old reliable start-stop-continue exercise is undefeated in surfacing the best ideas. To start, though, I asked Eileen to take me back to the catalyst for why she wanted to start the Lola. After my first, um, (laughs) I think, um, go at starting a company with Venture for America, I did some reflection as we, you know, pushed our fellows to do. So I, for the first time, I actually took pen to paper and tried to articulate, you know, why I wanted, what I wanted to do next and why, and what, what sort of the mission, um, was behind that. How did that get me closer to whatever career I wanted to build? And I remember looking at the worksheet, um, and it actually is a lot of the questions are from that, um, co-founders chapter and founders dilemma. Cause at certain point I realized, Oh, it's starting another company. Um, Mm. You know, I was able to articulate things that I never actually knew why I wanted or thought about. But one of them, I remember being like, I wanted to be a a role model to other Asian American women. And I remember reading that being like, oh, wow, actually, I've never like even thought of that, you know, out loud. And that's interesting. Um, So, yeah, I I think it was for whatever reason, I knew I wanted to start something else. I also knew that I was moving to Atlanta and leaving New York for the first time in my life. Um, so understanding that startup ecosystem was kind of the first step. Um, and, and the rest is history. I didn't intend on building another community startup. <laughs> um, you know, after the second time around, I realized I said, okay, I think there's, I'm probably on to something. This is a sweet spot of mine. And now, you know, five years into my second company, I am very much like, yes, I am a community builder. I love um, creating businesses and, and, you know, filling gaps and making an impact, but particularly in the community space. That's amazing. So, so for folks who don't know, can you tell me a little bit about kind of what, what the community is at the Lola, right? You said you wanted to do this community. This was something you've, you learned about yourself. Like what actually, uh, was the shape and form that the Lola took? So we, I think the first problem that we identified, and it's, it's, it's something that still um, continues to persist, that the work, like workplaces for the most part, whether it's a big company or a startup, is still um, a challenging environment for professional women. So is there a space? And we, you, we talked about space as like physical and virtual space. Is there a space that we can create to support women? Because oftentimes these environments cultivate um, competition, toxic culture, uh, women come and filter, you know, what they say, they can't bring their true self. So is there a space that we can create that's safe and comfortable for women to come together and talk through these challenges, support one another, thrive with more ease and less hustle is really what we're getting at. And our initial focus groups and surveys, um, we, we wanted to do pie in the sky stuff. So we had posted sessions similar to our ones at VFA and some of the fun ones were, you know, one of the questions would be, what do you think that a physical space designed for women needs to have? And we had one that one woman who was convinced that, and, you know, pre-pandemic at the time, we were all wearing heels and, um, you know, dressing up and looking our best. And she said that once you walk in, you have to take off your heels and then like the floors will feel like pillows <laughs> because we, <laughs> we have to, you know conform ourselves into to what society, you know, deems as appropriate business casual or, or workwear. Um, so we had some fun with that. And, you know, 
I think everyone understood when we were like, okay, realistically, we don't have a budget for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, <laughs> you we don't were have able padded to... <laughs> floors throughout, yeah. it's like trampoline style. Right, right. <laughs> um, but yeah, we were able to do other things where we took into account typical things like, you know, to this day in 2022, the vast majority of physical environments are still designed with men in mind, everything from office temperatures. Um, they basically gauge that um, based on like a male um, body um, and body temperature. I read somewhere like as late as 2008 or something, some of the prescription uh, medications instructions were updated because women were actively overdosing again, because they were mainly um, writing the instructions and directions for, wow. for male bodies. Um, so there's, it's called the co- the coded patriarchy. So we, we got really deep into that kind of stuff and thought, okay, realistically, what can we do? And so we have comfortable seating with, again, women um, and our bodies in, in mind, different um, sizes, because everyone, you know, there's not just one type. Um, we have purse six everywhere. We have a mother's room. We've got diapers and toys and all the things if you hmm. need backup childcare help. Um, so all the things that I think that offices uh, tend to lack, we made sure to, to include in our space. In case you couldn't tell already, Eileen is a thoughtful, purposeful community builder. And while she didn't pull off the floors that feel like pillows, she clearly had a specific vision in mind when she began planning for the physical space that the Lola would become. We're going to talk a lot more about this community that Eileen is building, but because of our shared history, I wanted to go back a bit to learn how her previous community building experience at Venture for America shaped this second go round. What was helpful from last time and what wasn't? I think the number one takeaway, and I didn't even realize going into Venture for America, I thought it was such a great um, program we were creating for entrepreneurs. Again, it hit me much later on the community and the power of the community but also the sense of belonging. And Mm. I saw that in the fellows and and you were in the first class and we were just doing things literally the night before trying to figure out what we were going to (laughs) do the next day at training camp. (laughs) And the thing that did hit me, um, and I remember you all giving us pushback too, it's the the sense of belonging. And, you know, we would joke around. It's like that fine balance between like religion and a cult and a (laughs) community Right. So we had you all um, recite this credo and it was like, you know, four or five values that we held true and we wanted everyone to kind of live and breathe. And that's probably in a weird way. We, we I think I realized we don't need to make <laughs> our members stand up every morning and recite those. <laughs> and we've moved away from that at, uh, at BFA well, as well, um, as far as I know. But at that sort of something that that North Star that we can all agree on that, yes, this is why we're here. We may, our backgrounds and, and our voices may look different, but we are all here because, again, and the problem initially when we first started was, it's still really hard out there for women. How can we come together and have an abundance mindset together? Because to date, there's been too many places that we're in that has a scarcity mindset. Mm. So you mentioned that North Star. One of my favorite parts, I've been spending a bunch of time on the Lola website, but one of my favorite parts is there's this description about your members, right? And so. You know this, but I'm going to read it. Uh, Our members are purpose-driven founders, freelancers, and creatives, corporate women, corporate expats from across industries. We are returners, some of us in our third and fourth careers. We're connectors, philanthropists, community activists, and so much more intentionally building the life and career we need to grow and thrive. So first of all, I think that that description is amazing, but I would have to imagine you didn't just, you know, arrive at those three or four sentences. So how did you d- decide that that was going to be your North Star and that was going to be who you were for? Didn't happen overnight. <laughs> I think we um, struggled early days. And I remember having strategy sessions because we were convinced that we were a place for corporate women. And my co-founder, mm. Martine, spent 20 years working at Turner, TNT, TBS, so in corporate so we both believed and agreed, like, corporate women need this. A lot of them don't know that they do, but they need it. So we were very much split in the beginning. Um, almost three, you know, a couple of years later, the audience told us, you know, who our core audience is, was where our community is now majority founders and freelancers. So that is who we serve now. That is who we focus on. Um, and then I like to joke around that the corporate women um, either couldn't find a way to engage because their companies 
take up so much headspace. So they couldn't figure out a way to come into our physical space or join our digital community. But also a lot of those women have since left. And, you know, the pandemic, I'm sure, has pushed them over the edge to do so. But a lot of the the way that, you know, the the corporate structure um, kind of has them operate, they, they left and they started their own thing. So now they're part of the founder and freelancer bucket. It's admirable to me that both in the moment and now looking back, Eileen can recognize that they were just plain wrong about who they thought this community was going to be for. Even the most perfectly laid plans can go awry, but as I think you'll find to be a theme with Eileen, she listened to what her community was telling her and she reacted accordingly. With her new target audience in mind, I was curious how, as a brand new resident of Atlanta, Eileen went about finding women to build out her new community. Yeah, I mean, from the get-go, we knew, especially being in a city like Atlanta and it being, I think it's over 51%, the population is Black. We knew we wanted our community population to reflect the diversity of the city. So early on, we recruited um, ambassadors, um, all women of color, and we said, hey, our networks only go so far. Will you you know, be open to opening up your networks, um, pitching and building brand awareness in hopes that we can get more diverse um, women across races into our community? And that did some, and I think everybody knows with diversity or any DEI efforts, you can't just do one thing and be like, cool, that's, that's <laughs> done, check. Um, so that was the first, one of the first things we did. And, um, I, and again, it, we kept on listening. That's the, one of the other big takeaways from, from VFA, um, just having an open mind and, and always like the active listening. I remember we talked a lot about, but when we would go mm -hmm. to visit the fellows in the different cities and, and the one, um, weekend in Providence always comes to mind. We did the post-it se sessions of stop, start, continue, still do that. Love that exercise. Me too. Um, some of the best ideas came out of that start um, column that we would take back and implement the next day. Um, I remember one was as simple as have the fellows take over, you know, our social media, um, do like a social media takeover and, and see what it's like through the eyes of an actual fellow versus the team trying to figure out and, you know, talk at you all the time. Um, so I definitely took that, uh, to the Lola while building the community and it still happens. I, I had a session yesterday with our, some of our black female entrepreneurs and one of them threw out an idea and I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> like we would have never <laughs> thought of that. That's amazing. And she was really sweet about it. She was like, yeah, it's a pretty good idea. <laughs> And has that extended into what you offer to members, right? So, uh, you know, gathering those ambassadors or doing, you know, a start, stop, continue exercise, does that then shift also not just, you know, who you want to bring into the community, but what the community might offer to them? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, part of our, our um, intentionally inclusive efforts is what we call it um, about a year and a half ago, the thesis that we created behind that effort and supporting more Black female entrepreneurs in our community because their Atlanta is chock full of them. The thesis was if we can better support the most underserved and underrepresented amongst our community of professional women, which, you know, the underserved and most underrepresented are the Black female entrepreneurs, then we will all benefit. So over the past year or so, we have really spent time to listen to them and figure out what are the challenges they have, what are what are the resources they need, and how can we best support them? Because realistically, we're not an accelerator. We don't want to be. We're a community where we really value connections and how can we help curate those connections so you can thrive better in your business life, in your personal life, et cetera. Community that values connection. If Eileen and the team at the Lola were there to curate those connections, they had to figure out the needs of their specific community. What types of connections were valuable to her community members? I was curious what Eileen uncovered as she started to build this community from scratch. When we looked at the landscape, even before we started the Lola, there's, there's so many women's organizations and groups. They tend to be pretty fragmented uh, by industry age and race. So we knew early on there's there's got to be value in cross industry um you know connections and collaborations. You can learn so much from someone who's younger and older in different industries, cross races. So that I feel like we that holds to be true. Um and 
if we are trying to support the most underserved, the the Black community, um, particularly in the Atlanta area, how can we expand their resources? How can we, and again, we're not looking to like teach them courses or anything like that. How can we set up their, their support system and their tribe so they can be more successful? And one of the things that we um, learned, and again, it was just like an anecdote, but when we welcomed our 55 Black Beam entrepreneurs early last year, we matched them with, and you're going to laugh because I called them Sherpas, and it's such a term <laughs> that I grabbed from BFA. I didn't want them to be mentors. Peer mentors didn't have a nice ring to it. So they were existing, I like Sherpas. Yes, existing members yeah. in the community who were charged to welcome and shepherd these new members um, so they you know, could help figure out how to navigate the community, tap into different resources and events. And um, a handful of them, most of the Sherpas were white women in our community. And when they were paired with these black female entrepreneurs, we saw the this special thing happen where we were intentionally connecting to networks that would have never overlapped. Mm. And the feedback that we got from both parties was this was not only career changing, but this was life changing for me. Um, wow. From the uh, Lola member, the, the white woman side, one of the um, anecdotes we got was, I've been doing this all wrong. She's an incredibly successful marketing executive. She's been mentoring tons of women behind her. And she learned through that, as well as our anti-racism sort of community group we have, that she has been trying to tell the younger folks she's been mentoring what she thinks that she would have wanted to hear when she was their age. But the reality is, if you're talking to a black woman who, you know, they have different lived experiences. So she's like, I've been doing this all wrong. I need to start over and figure out how I can better support all women, not just me when I was 20. Mm. Um, So that was really valuable to hear. And then from our um, black members, you know, truly the community and a sense of belonging, that was really our intention from the beginning. How do we make sure that we are an inclusive space that not only white women, Asian women, you know, Latinx women, but also black women feel like this is a space for me. And that is absolutely what we've heard. They've called our um, space. And when I say space, physical space and digital space, they said that it was a psychologically safe space for them. So that that to me was a very meaningful data point. Yeah. I mean, even as you started to describe the, the Sherpa program, I- I mean, for me, it was, I was thinking, oh, you know, I can see how that would be an amazing way to get them into the community, get them exposed to stuff faster than they would have without having that Sherpa, but wouldn't even have thought about those, uh, those additional network effects that you just described. And so it's amazing that it, it becomes so much more than just about, you know, the within the quote unquote four walls of the Lola, right? Like yeah. that level of not just acceleration for belonging in your community, but just in their entire career is, uh, you know, probably not one of those things that you can, you can put on the spreadsheet and, and measure, right? No, not at all. And again, when I think back, because we're sort of, I'm trying to now put this experience over the VFA one, we did that to for the fellows too. And some of it was a more of a mentor program. And some of those mm-hmm. relationships, I believe, still remain, um, you know, 10 years later. It's, and to me, that's, that's, that's where I get my kicks from community building when you're able to make those connections that people are like, oh my God, like, how did you know that we would <laughs> hit it off? I, I probably didn't. <laughs> but um, it's fun to, to connect and match folks. Can, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I, I, I admire that about you, the patience that you have to see the, like, the fruits of that, right? Like you're literally talking about a decision you made 10 years ago, right? To, to match me with Dan Kelly from, from yeah. uh, IAC, right? Like um, how do you think about that in, in, in terms of knowing that you're playing the long game as opposed to like, the instant gratification of like, okay, this is done. I did good work. I'm moving on to the next thing. I think that's the trickiest part of it. Cause also <laughs> some people don't tell you, some people are great of saying, Hey, by the way, mm. like just, I wanted to make sure you knew that this thing that happened, you know, um, brought me X, Y, and Z, but some people don't even mention it at all. And then I assume it was a total failure. Um, <sighs> but just the other day, this woman had never come into this, the physical space of the Lola. It had been a year. I assumed she wasn't getting anything out of it. And she came up to me and said, I have built so many friendships and relationships. Um, I just haven't seen you or told you 
or answered any of your emails or messages. So I, I think it's, I, 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 again, I think it's really tricky from a metric standpoint, but um, I, in my mind over time, I, I particularly enjoy this matchmaking. Um, I want to be clear. I don't think I'm, I would be a good like date matchmaker, <laughs> um, but I, I have always, you know, back in the VFA days, I remember, I don't know why I thought this was the solution, but I had two projectors going with spreadsheets of like the fellows and our mentors. And I just sat there manually talking through and making matches based on, and it's, you know, it varies, uh, common challenges and what the mentors, um, strengths were personality industry, whatever it was. And even to this day, I, I loosely do that. I just, I, I've, I, I always have a bad memory and I'm bad with names. I'm, I no longer can say that because I've been community building for 10 years. So <laughs> I have a system in my head now, but. Um, yeah, I enjoy kind of thinking of two people and if they haven't met that, I think that they would hit it off. I will tell you there's probably, I'm trying to like shot in the dark, maybe like a 30 to 40% success rate. If you're looking at a group of like 50 or a hundred, um, it's a total crapshoot. So the success for even the 10% that will stay in touch for life is, yeah. is, you know, good enough for the yeah for like the 20 percent. i mean we have some folks that six months into that partnership program some woman said could i have another sherpa she never responded <laughs> and i looked at her and i said oh i really wish you would have reached out and let me know and she's like you, you're busy i didn't want to bother you um but you know that's the whole point of the program so always always learning and figuring out how to best um increase that percentage of success but it's we're dealing with people it takes a special kind of person to have the patience and the persistence to curate connections like this. It's honestly incredible to me. On one end of the spectrum, Eileen makes matches that are, quote, career changing and life changing. And on the other end of the spectrum, she never hears a word. What's crazier, some of those matches that are silent could also be going amazingly well. She puts her community members first, and that couldn't be more evident. Throughout our conversation, you've heard Eileen and I refer a couple times to both a physical and digital component of the Lola's offering. Like so many physical co-working spaces, the Lola was rocked by the pandemic just eight months after opening its doors in July of 2019. So I asked her, what is it like to try to build a brand new community in the middle of a pandemic? Oh, it's so wild. I think <laughs> I immediately wished... I remember looking at my husband and saying, why don't either of us have pandemic proof careers? <laughs> 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 because he's in, he works at a marketing agency and, you know, everyone kind of hit pause on, on work like that. It, it was, it was scary at first. We very quickly pivoted to doing a hundred percent virtual. And then we launched our digital platform on Mighty Networks, which is a great um, digital community. Um, but Again, the trickiest thing is that we're working with human beings and it's not just, you know, we're, we're obviously providing a service, um, but their behaviors are constantly changing and evolving throughout the pandemic. So we want them to connect and engage in the community and they pay us for that. But it's so funny because a lot of people continue to pay, but we don't hear from them. They don't do anything. Um, I always go back to like it being a gym membership because there's always people that pay for years and are too scared to like yeah. cancel it or whatever. Um, and I don't want us to be that, but, um, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, everybody was just shocked and scared. So we were all gathering online. It was awesome. And then everyone, uh, late fall 2020, um, experienced that zoom fatigue. And so then nobody engaged. And so we were constantly evolving. I think it will continue to, um, you know, I caught myself saying post pandemic and it's like, Oh, we're not, we're not quite there yet. So mm. we, I think it's even more important and integral for us to continue to listen because everyone's needs are changing. The future of work is changing. The, the way our members utilize our physical space is actually, in fact, um, changing as well. So just trying to stay nimble throughout all that. And so do you envision some, some kind of hybrid as like the long-term model for you guys? Yeah, you know, we, our assumption early on before we launched our physical space was that we, it's 5,000 square feet over two floors. We thought that we've maxed out at 350 members. We got to 400 really quickly, um, shortly after we opened and weren't, didn't feel like we were, had reached capacity. So we wanted to see what 500 looks like. 
Um, we're slowly working our way back to that number, but I'm already convinced because people who used to come five days a week no longer because we have more flexibility sure. in the way we work. So I think we could push it north of six, seven hundred, maybe more. Um, so I think from a business model standpoint, that that's got a lot of opportunity for us. Um, yeah, I'm I'm interested to see if that stays, if that sticks, or yeah. if it continues to change. I feel like that's a that's a whole new kind of um, cross section of of the different types of people you have in your community too, right? Like I know for myself, you know, we're we're digital first at Drift, but you know, I happen to live somewhat close to one of our offices, so like I go in once a week because I I enjoy it, right? I like seeing yeah. people, and I like doing some sort of like big team thing on a, you know, once a quarter, once every other quarter basis that like that gives me energy, but I know that that that's not everybody. And so I think that would be really interesting for communities like yours to figure out, okay, what is the makeup of our community in terms of the people who like thrive off of that yeah. in-person interaction versus the folks who, you know, only want to take advantage of those digital resources. And to your point, you know, could be digital only members of your community forever. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's the people have, I, th I feel like people share this more um, easily uh, since we started the pandemic, but like being an introvert, I'm an extroverted introvert. So really being attuned to what, what kind of environment yeah. makes me thrive. I think that's really important. We have like a upstairs uh, distraction free library space for our nice. introverts who don't want to be in like a coffee shop setting in our, our main area. So I think it's continuing to play off of that especially from a community standpoint, um, introverts um, generally, because there's a lot of different types, prefer more one-on-one -on -one connection. So making sure we have those kind of options versus come to this big event, this wine tasting yeah. or something and, and be yeah. overwhelmed. So for sure, it's going to be really interesting. And I think too, like if you, if you like that library introvert setting and you don't necessarily have a physical space that you can work from on a daily basis, right? Like that's, that's a perfect little niche to, to be able to fill that void for folks who, you know, might not have a space at home or have a bunch of roommates, right? Like there's just like, there's so many yeah. different possibilities that people might have in their personal life that would make a space like that way, way more welcoming and, and fit for what they need as opposed to, you know, the giant, you know, loud, noisy networking office environment. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're tapping into, yeah, I think all the folks who are trying to figure out what the future of work looks like, <laughs> I think that's really, yeah. you know, coffee shops, co-working spaces. I think that's all for sure. What that's going to look like is going to be really interesting. Before we go, at the end of each show, we're going to ask each guest the same lightning round of questions. Ready? Here we go. Best book you've read in the last six months? Um... I feel like I, I wish I could give you a, um, like a learning one. Um, the one that sticks out is <laughs> Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. And she's a, a black female author. And it's, um, it's around, around race and sort of, um, it talks about a white passing twin and, and one who's darker um, skin color, but very much um, as an Asian American and with all the um, sort of racial injustice. It's a good read um, for a different perspective on um, race and how that's perceived. Vanishing half, you said? Yep. Nice. All right. Uh, favorite part about working in ops? I still consider you an ops. Yeah, I still consider me an ops too. <laughs> um, I, I think for me, for the first time in my career, I've been a, I have enjoyed um, and I've learned the most um, figuring out how to apply DEI to operations. I think I'm, I'm a nerd mm -hmm. where I love process, you know, Trello boards, all the, the pieces of software, Airtable. But how do I track and very much what we talked about, how do I track the um, our, our points and goals and success uh, successes as it relates to DEI? Cool. We'll have to have you back. We do a whole episode just on th that topic alone, I think. Yeah. Um, least favorite part about working in ops? Oh, I, you know, it always takes a certain personality and it's very much uh, so many thankless things um, as, you know, it relates to just people call it admin, all the, all the stereotypes that we ops people are like, it's more than that. <laughs> um, 
I think it gets it still has somewhat of a, a mixed um, mixed bag of reputation. Someone who impacted you getting to the job you have today. Um. Oh man, this is the first person that popped into mind. But I was just telling you that I saw Charlie Krull. He was an early board member at VFA Talk, and he actually gave me some really solid advice as I was transitioning from VFA to the Lola. Awesome. Uh, and last one, one piece of advice for people who want to have your job someday. Oh, figure out if it's something that you uh, thrive in, right? And I think I'm sure a lot of people have said it as it relates to operations, it takes a certain personality to thrive in it. And it's managing a lot of different pieces. Um, I think community building, similarly, it can be draining. Um, so if you, I think figuring out day to day, if it's something that really um, gives you energy versus drains you, I think that's really important to figure out. Thanks so much to Eileen Lee for joining us on this week's episode of Operations. And thanks to Dan Kelly for being my mentor all those years ago in the beginnings of Venture for America. If you like what you heard today, make sure you're subscribed to our show. A new episode comes out every other Friday. And if you learn something from Eileen or from any of our episodes, make sure you leave us a review to let us know what you've learned. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, six star reviews only. All right. That's going to do it for me. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time.